The West is where the country's tolerance for living with wolves is now facing its greatest test. It is a land of great potential for the large carnivores, big on space and rich with prey. But it is also a land where livestock still rules the open range. It is a land of raw human emotions, infused with fear and distrust, ingrained from generations past. If I see a wolf, if he's close enough to where he's supposed to be worrying my sheep, I'm going to shoot him. John Faulkner is a third-generation sheepman who runs one of the largest sheep operations in Idaho, much of it on public land. And ordinarily, he would have no hesitation if he saw a wolf near his sheep. But in the Wood River Valley of Idaho's Sawtooth National Forest, John Faulkner and other sheep ranchers are attempting a different approach toward keeping sheep and wolves apart without deadly bullets. With the help from the conservation group Defenders of Wildlife, Idaho Fish and Game, U.S. Forest Service, and U.S. Wildlife Services, the ranchers of the Wood River Valley have been testing their non-lethal techniques in what is considered the Sheep Superhighway of Central Idaho, patrolled as it is by the resident Phantom Hill Wolf Pack. On the hour, every hour, get up and turn my telemetry on, uh, see if there are any signals from the local wolves that have collars and I'm uh, switching between the, the alpha male and the alpha female, which are the two wolves in the pack that have collars. Uh, I can only pick up signals from, from wolves that are wearing the, uh, the radio collars. Jesse Timberlake is the manager of the Wood River Project for the Defenders of Wildlife. As well as he must watch his sheep, Timberlake must watch his wolves. Last night, uh, there were wolves howling all around, uh, just on the on the ridge above where the sheep were. So when they do that, then I, I get up and start walking around the sheep, making sure they're right. If the wolves keep on howling, then uh, I have an air horn I might use to scare them away, or a little starting pistol. For more than a decade now, since wolves returned to the Rocky Mountains, the defenders of wildlife have been paying ranchers to compensate for their losses. Here in the Wood River Valley, where the losses were once more frequent, they've lately found that new precautions have largely precluded those payments. It's going to cost them more money to pay off us than what they're going to spend on their two people they had out with that one band over there. This year we didn't have any trouble over there but one and they weren't there that night. Are they done? Uh, and the herders saw four or five wolves the next morning. Another collaborator in this groundbreaking experiment in non-lethal wolf control is Mike Stevens of Lava Lake Lamb, whose introduction to raising sheep in wolf country was a lesson never to be forgotten. In 2002, we had wolves uh, come into that sheep band in three successive nights, and they killed a total of 18 ewes and lambs. So that was a pretty big wake-up call for us. Then uh, we started implementing a number of uh, proactive measures at that time. And that turns on the alarm, which has this high-intensity strobe light and two speakers that have noise that changes. In a situation like this, it's just to alert the herder because the sheep are already in, they're not going to be in this enclosure, but we want to let the herders know, you better get up because you got wolves close by. Call it wolves. In the Northern Rockies, where some perceive wolves as the biggest threat to livestock, the facts tell a different story. Wolves have been found responsible for less than 1% of the region's sheep and cattle losses. Far more dangerous are disease and bad weather, even the domestic dog, man's best friend, 
is recently on record for killing five times as many livestock as their wild cousin, the wolf. And so our view about wolves was that certainly they present some challenges for our operation, our sheep operation. We're running about 5,000 sheep over a very large area. But we also recognize that wolves are an important part of a fully functioning eco ecosystem. And so when we first found that we had lost sheep to wolves in 2002, our first instinct was, well, what is a way that we're gonna be able to coexist with these animals? And we have pretty successfully, in all, in all those years, since 2002 through 2008, we've had zero depredations with the exception of 2005. And in every one of those years, we've used some combination of approaches, including use of telemetry, really close communications with the agencies in order to understand what the wolf packs were doing, uh, and then the use of flattery, night watches, et cetera. To, uh, to deter the wolves from coming in. And we've had a number of instances where tracks uh, were seen or wolf howls were detected within a quarter mile or less of the sheep band. Wolves will continue to be present in the landscape. And so we believe that implementing these methods and approaches is necessary regardless of the legal status of wolves. And so it's been fabulous from the standpoint of people you know working together to come up with a single outcome of let's reduce the impact of wolves on on the sheep operations and then uh, subsequently reduce the impact of wolf control or predator control on the wolf population and to have just the loss of one sheep in a summer of grazing is is pretty remarkable whether it's wolves or bears or uh, mountain lions, other coyotes, other predators also live within the system too. And so it's been a you know, remarkably good uh, year for the livestock operators as well as for the wildlife, the, the predator populations.